so lecture five one, Ross methodology. Ross has several key aspects to his methodology that are worth considering at this point. First is distributed computing. Ross nodes are software modules running on potentially different computers. Okay, so they're pretty simple. It's just like a program running. Um, and that's what we'll call a node. Nodes communicate by sending messages over a network peer to peer, that is directly to each other. This lack of centralization is very flexible and scalable. So there's nothing, there's no sort of central message repository that's, um, that everybody's communicating to and then that's routing messages among the different nodes. They actually communicate directly with each other. Um, and this is, this is nice in that uh, multiple computers can be um, running nodes, multiple robots can be running nodes, robots and computers can be running nodes, and then they can interact with each other via sending messages uh, to each other. So uh, we'll talk more about this and the sort of structure that it creates um, called the, the, the Ross graph. Uh, in the next chapter, um, but that's the sort of the start of it. Um, nodes and sending messages peer to peer. Okay, uh, we'll discuss it more. It, I, that link didn't get resolved. That's what the question marks are. Uh, use with other programs. So Ross systems can easily interact with software tools for visualization, navigation, data logging, et cetera. So uh, instead of building into ROS a, um, uh, like a, a central way of doing data logging or a central way of doing um, navigation of the different ROS nodes or uh, visualizing the, the ROS graph, which is like the connections among all the nodes, um, it, it, uh, it has, it is created so that other software tools can be used to do those things. Um, while Ross itself just stays focused on its core tasks. So in the, uh, when we're doing simulation, for instance, Ross itself doesn't do the nice, 3D visualizations that we'll see. Uh, it uses other software to do that, um, which allows that other software to sit over there on its own. It can do 3D visualizations, and ROS itself is not um, is not doing that. It's just interacting with another tool to do that. So that's another sort of methodology that that ROS uses throughout um, all of its instantiations. Okay, another key aspect of ROS is its multilinguality. So ROS programs can be written in several languages, including Python, C++, and MATLAB. The most popular are Python and C++, and you, we will use the former. Um, the support for MATLAB is sort of varied and um, it is possible to do some really cool stuff in MATLAB. We might explore that a little bit uh, later on, but we're going to focus on using Python, which is the, the sort of most popular one. C++ is used a lot um, as well, and primarily that's for efficiency. Um, but there are actually several languages that have um, what are called uh, client libraries. So, um, client libraries. So it, it's pretty cool that this one mm -hmm. software framework allows us to write um, in multiple languages and interact with um, ROS nodes that could be running other languages, in fact. So they don't all have to, all the nodes don't have to be running the same uh, 
language. They don't have to be written in the same languages, which is pretty cool. Modularity. ROS developers, you, okay, are encouraged to write programs in a modular manner such that each module performs some limited task, then composing several modules to perform more complex tasks. This is a good idea in software in general, but especially when you're going to be creating something that once you put it all together is going to be very, very complex. Um, this is a, a very important thing to do when you're writing big software projects. So this makes debugging, maintenance, and collaboration much, much easier. Um, and it also allows us to do, um, so this collaboration that we've discussed uh, is an important part of ROS actually. So previously developed ROS programs are available in the default ROS installation and in the form of additional packages. We'll discuss packages more in the next chapter. So ROS packages are um, actually what we will be writing as well. So everything that you write is hopefully in the form of a package. And uh, there's some sort of strict um, conventions for writing ROS packages and they help us um, write our own software. They also help us to use other people's packages that they've uh, developed. So it's pretty cool. It's very well organized instead of um, there are some software projects that are not as well organized and they're a pain to deal with. So this one's actually pretty, pretty nice to work with. The last one. Is, oh, yeah. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what is Rust? And I mean, if we are using like different programming language. And uh, so in that case, like Rust is like environment or I mean, what is ROS then? Yeah, so ROS is um, is this entire sort of framework that tells you, okay, you can write a program in Python or you could write a program in Ruby, but if you want to interact with this, uh, with ROS, like with the different nodes in the ROS uh, uh, network, a ROS graph, then uh, you will need to do it in a certain way. So um, when, when you want to write ROS programs in a given language like Python, you need to install different client libraries in order to do that. So you can't just, you can't just write any old Python code. You have to write Python code in a certain way. So you can oh, use okay. a lot of the Python you know, typical like if statements for um, uh, the, the logic and the different syntax that Python uses, but there will be certain commands that will be specific to ROS. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's a good question. And I, I, I realize that um, this, <laughs> this class is very software heavy, um, especially for engineers uh, but I think that one of the nice things about it is that um, this is a pretty well developed uh, body of, of software to use and so um, although there is a learning curve there's a lot there are a lot of resources to help help you succeed so I think it'll I think it'll be all right yeah um, and so the last, the last thing I wanted to mention about ROS is it's open sourceness. So it's open source. The licensing is such that commercial, proprietary um, software can include it as well, making it a good choice for research and industry. So a lot of research, as you know, is open source, where researchers will write GitHub repositories for their software, and um, they'll be available um, on the web but uh, some companies don't want their the source of their software to be uh, online and and so they they um, can use ROS the license is such that um, they can use ROS to write their own proprietary software as well and they can also write some components that are proprietary 
can interact with open source components. And so it's very flexible in that regard. So there are, are some companies that write um, proprietary software using ROS, um, but uh, uh, the pa those packages are proprietary, but um, a lot of ROS packages are available to everyone. So, yeah. That's, uh, so that's sort of the, the sort of some of the key aspects of ROS to keep in mind. Um, and then we're going to get into, uh, next I'll do some installation uh, tutorials. And then once we have our development environments set up, we can move on and start learning about some of the sort of key concepts in, in ROS. All right.